Um, this project began in the sound ethnographies workshop at Union Docks in Brooklyn. And I'm deeply indebted to the work of Jim Yusin, Kevin T. Allen, Mayo Colbert, Ernst Carroll, Peter McMurray, Zach Poff, Benjamin Tausig, and other participants. I'd also like to thank and acknowledge the expertise and assistant of my, assistance of my coworkers at Niagara Custom Lab, Sylvain Chasse, who's here today, <laughs> Ali Vanderkirk, who couldn't be bothered, <laughs> <laughs> Adam Stewart, who also couldn't be bothered, and Sebastian Hendrickson, who could never be bothered. Um, <laughs> lastly, I want to thank my partner, Eugenia Zorowski and my child, Ruby Zorowski Jenkins, for their love, tolerance, and support. <clears throat> Part one, setting. <laughs> You'll notice I'm from kind of a different context because I'm going to read this exactly like an academic paper. <laughs> My father tended machines. For 35 years, working in rotating shifts, he stood beside a roaring machine and watched enormous rolls of paper form. He came home covered in white globs of pulp, smelling of bleach and dust. His crumpled orange earplugs are talismans of my childhood. But by the time the government enforced their use, his hearing had been damaged beyond repair. And the ambient buzz of his world is now attended by a constant distant ringing, among the many other physical ailments accrued via manual labor. His hearing has, exasperate, has exacerbated his garbled southern accent, and now most people find him hard to understand, his already limited means of expression dulled by a lifetime of work. As a teenager, I worked summers at the mill, most of the time on the graveyard shift. I would have dreams about the sounds I heard there. In the ceilings of cavernous warehouses, boxes of paper crawled along moving belts, the rollers chirping like nested bats. Whizzing around in a fork truck, filled hissing with compressed petroleum, engine stuttering at the limit of its safety governor, sliding into corners on the smooth concrete floor, I gathered scraps of paper and dented metal bins to feed the giant leaf hopper. I woke up with a start more than once to the near clang of a giant clamp gripping these bins, lifting them over the grinding mass of recycled paper and shaking them until empty. I still dream those sounds. But I didn't tend a machine. That was a union job and one that required expertise, a fairly narrow expertise, but expertise nonetheless. I worked on the back end of the process loading giant rolls of paper into cargo trains heading to a packaging plant, or gleaning stray bits of paper from corners, as well as imperfect rolls and stacks plucked from the assembly line to pulp and reprocess. I worked summers while I was being educated. I was just visiting. When I stand beside the processing machines at Niagara Custom Lab, I hear a rhyme of my father's labor, an echo of his experience, and my sonic environment feels like an inheritance. They are remarkably similar machines. The resonance would have more power if what he had been making were Bristol board or typing paper, some means of creating art, but it was toilet paper. He made a lifetime of toilet paper. Now I am a worker in an artistic setting and an artist in an industrial setting. My lived experience is hybrid and I sought to reproduce this hybridity here in the factory. The space is purposefully prismatic. The ambient bleed, which is a kind of harmony of indexical significance in the industrial context, is here situated as pure sensation. The sounds, rather than being flattened to noise or cacophony, borrow and are activated by institutional significance. The visitor will not attain or be granted the illusion of indexical understanding. This is that. It means this, but the act of listening with intent and patience to disassociated sounds lends them a different form of knowledge, one that makes no claims to be knowledge at all, one that they could hear in dreams. This is the knowledge lent to us by sensory documentary. 
I want to talk about why it is important to make no claims. But first, I want to ask you to consider the setting. Here we are in the factory. I suppose it took that name long ago, when Hamilton could still lay claim to a meaningful, immediate relationship to the production of steel. But now it's, na it's a name that begs direct consideration. We've all heard the slogan, art is the new steel. Like many economic initiatives in this city, it makes casual, casually brutal claims. I believe that artists in the area are struggling in good faith with our working class inheritance, as evidenced by the recent Art and Social Strata Conference, among other local initiatives. But what does it mean to lay claim to that inheritance, to take that name as an outsider? What does it mean to make and show art in the midst of a gentrifying neighborhood? amongst workers who have lost their pensions and are even now losing their homes? What is the proper subject of art in the midst of, the socio of this socioeconomic relation, let alone the larger project of settler colonialism? For now, because I have chosen to be a worker, I can somewhat straddle that relation. But how can I retain a meaningful dialogue with work when I enter into the, into the co institutional context? What can I bring along that cannot be described as a form of extraction? Part two, context. I note that I have chosen to be a worker, and certain things about my background have made that decision possible, while other things have made it seem inevitable. But the fact of the matter is rooted in precarity, both in terms of my life as a child of the working class and the life of a medium. I make and support the making of analog film in the context of obsolescence. I once heard a story secondhand about two elder filmmakers, both white and male, one famously prolific and affable, the other among the most revered and influential Canadian filmmakers. The former had made a goofy psychodrama that the latter considered frivolous. I loved it and still do. Accosting him at dinner, he asked, as a kind of accusation, don't you want to make films that last forever? It strikes me as an outrageous proposition at any point in history, but particularly so against the backdrop of ecological collapse, of capricious technologism, of global war and hardening capitalist stratification, of catastrophic inequity. To think that any category of human production but particularly one so natively contingent as film could last forever is simply ludicrous. I hope we can all agree. <laughs> but even within the fantastic contingency of all human production, film is noticeably perishable. The film material itself degrades over time. The life of a film strip is finite and technologies of reproduction are themselves destructive. Access to operational film equipment is limited, and knowledge of that equipment is vanishing because it is so heavily reliant on access. The technicians who know the equipment well are aging, and anyway cannot be tasked with surmounting the physical realities of obsolescence. Once these machines are dormant for a certain amount of time, it becomes exponentially difficult to bring them back to life. Anyone who has tried to get a Steenbeck editing table up and running is familiar with the consequences of disrepair. The medium is losing ground to entropy. And as critics have pointed out in various contexts, capitalism itself is a social alliance with obsolescence. It's not just that your iPhone is designed to be useless in a couple years, but that the system with which we organize society is invested in the idea of progress as technologically disruptive. Though, Ni though Niagara Custom Lab still services many universities and colleges, the majority of film schools long ago killed off their analog programs, selling and even trashing equipment that for various institutional reasons cannot simply be replaced just because Beyonce and Christopher Nolan have students demanding to shoot real film again. Kodak itself once lost its way, and its misadventures over the last couple of decades proved the death blow for large swaths of the film ecosystem. The decision it is making now, which we will return to later, may yet take more victims. Niagara Custom Lab is on the front lines of this collapse. 
one of the few remaining commercial labs in all of Canada. It is the only commercial lab running several of the processes that have traditionally been the domain of experimental artists and amateur filmmakers. Super 8, Regular 8, 16mm and 35mm black and white, and of course the E6 process for color reversal. To provide this range of services, the, the lab runs nine different machines with an extremely small staff, struggling every day against the gradual wear and tear to the continuous for the continuous maintenance of machines that are now several decades old. Despite these challenges and rampant aspersions about the lack of demand, we process roughly 50,000 feet a month. In addition to processing our processing services, the lab continues to make new prints for internationally recognized artists who sometimes have nowhere else to turn for the kind of care and attention we can provide. Combined with the physical challenges presented by this work, the supposed vanishing demand for these services, and the attendant scarcity of resources for film production, is the rising price and narrowing range of film stock. One direct, consequences, one direct consequence of Codex bankruptcy was the, dis, was the discontinuation of two of their signature stocks, Kodachrome and Ektachrome. Importantly, these venerable camera stocks were developed for consumer-grade photography and later adopted by artists working at the margins of motion picture film production. Though prescient filmmaker stockpiled Ektachrome immediately following the announcement of its discontinuation, and have supplemented their practices with a third inferior color reversal in the interim, the loss of these stocks has been catastrophic. No other color reversal motion picture film stock is currently in production. I chose to focus this work on the E6 process because the challenges facing color reversal stock are both emblematic of the challenges facing motion picture filmmaking at large and singular to this most recognizable of motion picture image profiles. Paul Simon could hinge an entire song on Kodachrome because these images have the look of memory itself. Though Kodachrome's process was infamously complex, another, co another Kodak reversal stock, Ektachrome, eventually captured something of that story beauty with a much simpler process. The E6 machine was the first process I ran at the lab. It is the most reliable machine and the slowest, although also the most complex. Since I started running the machine, the weekly demand has dwindled considerably. The chemicals are designed to be used often and they degrade quickly. They must be seasoned from use, but also continuously replenished. Because Kodak no longer produces the stock, it also no longer produces the necessary chemicals. We purchase chemicals that Fuji produces for its E6 slide film in small batches and at great cost. And we've lately been processing 100 feet to 250 feet a week. For comparison, I've processed 4,000 feet of color negative stock this week. The lab is almost certainly running this machine at a loss. The characteristics that make this stock special also make it hard to reproduce. Even before these stocks were discontinued, stocks designed specifically for, re for their reproduction were long gone. The few remaining color inner negative options are far from optimal even a waste of effort, without significant creative interventions by the technician. This is a hard thing to have to communicate to a great artist who shot her best films on co original color reversal, and who, like me, is unwilling to consider the idea that digital capture is a substitute for film-on-film -film reproduction. Here's a sample of a dinner party conversation I rehearsed with exhausting regularity. Isn't film dead? Why would you choose to work in a dead meat? <laughs> to which I answer, would you ask the same question of a painter who uses oils? They tend to get my drift, and maybe in the same way you can understand that a digital reproduction of an oil painting is insufficient to the task. Film isn't dead, no. But in the question's very ignorance, film is acknowledged to be mortal. And color reversal is peculiarly mortal. It is a singular interpretation of a vision. This part is key. All color film is never more or less than an interpretation of light. Contrary to black and white photography, which might more aptly be termed, and was originally conceived to be, a system of measurement, 
Color photography is an act of creation. Light strikes the emulsion that is not captured, but is reproduced by pigments native to the emulsion itself. After you accept this, the problem of reproduction becomes more immediate. The image we experience establishes clear boundaries. Add to that the illusion of motion, and you are deep into something that is ontologically distinct. Color reversal images, like us, are born to die. And now, in the context of obsolescence, previous technologies of resuscitation no longer exist. In a bit of optimism, Kodak last year announced that it is bringing back Ektachrome. The very first thing it discovered, discovered, like a behemoth striding over the ants, was that the decision to dis discontinue the stock had destroyed the ecosystem within which the stock had flourished. Kodak could no longer even purchase the materials used to create the emulsion nor had it the ability to process the stock on site. Its engineers had to start from scratch. We've yet to see any sign of their success beyond an empty box held up at a consumer expo. Maybe Kodak will succeed in rehabilitating the, is, the ecosystem it destroyed. In the meantime, it has increased the cost of many of its consumer camera and print stocks by 30%. Part three, practice. The film theorist Thomas Alsasser has lately discussed the interest of artists, galleries, and museums in obsolete technology. This is a long quote. One of the strategic uses of obsolescence as a critical concept can be found in the fact that, being a term that inevitably associates both capitalism and technology, it is of special interest in the context of both the art world and audiovisual media, both old and new because it is implicitly acknowledges that today there is no art outside capitalism and technology. For if capitalism is still the most revolutionary, which is to say the most disruptive force in the contemporary world, it is at the same time the untranscendable horizon of, thinking, of our thinking and being. This not only means that there is no outside to the inside, which renders any critical stance that much more difficult to protect from being co-opted, but it gives obsolescence a new kind of self-contradictory dignity. It is on the inside, but it makes it stand against the inside, and thus speaks a paradoxical truth of which it itself, it is itself the embodiment. This insight into the critical role of obsolete technology within the institution dovetails neatly with the central problems of the documentary impulse. The lie of objectivity, the colonial project of understanding, the gathering of images, information as a form of resource extraction. These concerns, dating back to the beginning of what we recognize as the genre, cannot be escaped by any critical stance, are basic to the practice of documentary. There is no outside to the inside. Recent currents of thought, like object-oriented ontology and speculative nonfiction, at least in practice, have always struck me as, a flimsy, as flimsy alibis for whiteness, for power. Strategies for disconnecting the work from political economy and the larger project of imperialism. Bruno Latour may claim an alliance with the object, but it's his, it's his name on the book I'm reading. The only satisfactory response to these problems that I've found are to one, foreground mediation, and two, resist simply indexical representation. There's a long tradition against the so-called, amongst the so-called marginal filmmakers to adopt consumer grade technologies. Analog filmmakers make art with Super 8 cameras with Bolexes, with cheap and reclaimed equipment. In doing so, they embrace happy accidents, light leaks, soft focus, uneven development, the hallmarks of the amateur. And as a result, they never fully disappear behind the work. The act of recording the work is ever present to the experience of viewing the work. Additionally, after Brackage, the lyric self and the representation of individual perception was folded into the experimental project. 
The works associated with this current of production approach abstraction, defy simple logocentric interpretation, and most importantly, resist mobilization by capital. If one object of my practice is to, view, is to diffuse my influence on the transmission of information, I can only do so by repeatedly reminding the reviewer of my presence, by calling attention to the illusions which are native to motion pictures. The vocabulary of experimental film, the very act of using obsolete technology, the challenges that attend this decision, and the mere presence of the film material all serve this end. Similarly, in creative field recording, the impurity of extraction has made it obvious. The alien qualities of the sound resist indexical meaning, while the economy of the techniques combined with determined transparency, resist mystification. Nothing you hear in this room costs much to make. Every recording was treated as a complete sound. Artifice abounds, but only insofar as reproduction itself is artificial. I've been calling what I'm doing here sensory documentary to distinguish it from sensory ethnography, which designates a sound as anything assigned meaning. Sensory documentary does not present meaning as its object, and sound in particular is slippery on this point. Not all sound is simply knowledge, or even knowable, and it is never just one thing. It is variously pleasurable, painful, durational, physical. The sounds around us may contain knowledge, but they needn't, and I certainly didn't put it there with intent, because that might mean taking it from somewhere else and in doing so, changing it. My hope is that I have made a form of knowledge, one which might wilt under designation as such, accessible. I am constantly returning to pictures of the sunset. There is a beauty everywhere around us. One documentary impulse is to gather this beauty up, to distribute it. We've all seen these documentaries, which are mostly just beautiful. But any act of gathering can do violence to the world. What does beauty gain from this mediation? I used to think that probably the sunsets in my hometown were especially spectacular because of the way that light interacted with all the pollutants spilling out of the paper mill where my father worked. On my morning commute by train, I've noticed similar, similarly, I'm having a hard time with similar today, <laughs> similarly spectacular sunrises behind the thicket belching stacks, the thicket of belching stacks along the bay in Hamilton. What do we have to lose? A sunset takes our breath away. So we pull out our phones, snap a picture, and post the picture to Instagram. Our followers interface with it. An entire chain of capital is set into motion. Is a moment of quiet with the attention economy worth so little that we would give it away for free. Is this now how we relate to the sunset? The poet Anne Boyer writes, the beauty we can see can be a problem. Our sight of all senses is that which most deceives because to see is to believe. Urbanity and capital can mean dazzled eyes even when every other part of us hurts. What if I can record the sound of a sunset? I'm not talking crickets, frogs, or birdsong. I'm talking about the passing of light from the face of the hemisphere, the seeping of evening dew from the earth, the swelling soil, a cosmic sound. It is there to be recorded, though I cannot imagine how. Let's say that I could, maybe a microphone capsule that will blot out the sky. If, after our initial wonder, it is reduced to our mediation of it, how long before I stop being able to hear anything else? How long before I stop be able to, how long before I stop being able to hear anything at all? Mm -hmm.